Welcome to the Office of Federal Emergency Relief Programs Office Hour. We hold these every Thursday, the first Thursday of every month at 9 a.m. However, today what we have done is we have repurposed this office hour to really focus in on liquidation extension. And this might be information that's helpful for you to folks or may not be pertinent based on where you are with all of your programming and your financial expenditures. So just as usual, we'll do quick instructions of our team. We do encourage you to take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat box with your name, title, and your school community. Email address is optional, but that helps us make the connections to who we have in the room and also how we might be able to support you folks. My name is Shelly Shasi Jandro. I'm the director of the Office of Federal Emergency Relief Programs, supporting the work and all of the CARES, Carissa, and ARP ESER funds. And hi, I'm Karen Kusiak, and we should need we need to update this slide. Um, I coordinated CARES. I've been coordinating Carissa. And I've recently uh, assumed responsibility for coordinating the ARP applications um, and other special projects within the, uh, the within our little office. Good morning. I'm Kevin Harrington, and I'm leading the Gear and EANS efforts and working with the non-public schools. Hi, I am Aisha Asha. I am the federal fiscal coordinator. I support the reimbursement side of these funds. Good morning, I'm Deanna Roberge, and I am one of the management analysts. Good morning, I'm Terry Beal, and I'm the other management analyst. <laughs> and as Karen mentioned, she's taking on the responsibilities of ARP in addition to Carissa and finishing up any of the items related to CARES along with the special projects because our wonderful colleague Monique Sullivan has transitioned to a new role within the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education as the School Improvement Coordinator. So she's still supporting school districts just in a different manner than our, our work with emergency relief funds and we wish her the best of luck. So and today, Shelley, as I mentioned, don't... we are repurposing the office hour today to focus in on information about late liquidation extension. So we're gonna def define the term of liquidation. We'll also highlight the obligation requirements which play a critical role when we discuss liquidation extension. We'll share our application process as well as the US Department of Ed's application process. And then we will open it up for questions. I will indicate to you folks that our team is monitoring the chat box. So if you do have any questions and you want to go ahead and put those in the chat box, great. In addition, don't hesitate to pause our conversation and ask the question that you may have based on the information that is being shared. So liquidation requirements. Liquidation is a concept that has been known of all federal programs. It is part of the closeout. So the federal awarding agency, which is the main department of education, we are also known as the pass-through agency, must close out every federal award. And there are some administrative tasks associated with that, one of them being closing out all the fiscal items of any award. With any federal program, there is an automatic statutory obligation of 120 days after the end of the period of performance. That 120 calendar days is referred to as the liquidation period. And that 120 days is both for the pass-through agency, so the main department of education, as well as our SAUs. So you may have noticed on your grant award notification, it indicates that 1230 of 23, if we're referring to Carissa funding, is the date in which all invoices need to be submitted or funds will no longer be accessible. That uh, 90 days is the 90 days that we have agreed upon with our colleagues 
within the Division of Administrative and Financial Services because every invoice that an SAU submits also needs to be reviewed by the state agency, which is our DAS accountants, as well as ourselves. And that 120 days is for all entities, the SAU and the SEA, which is why we have the 12-30-23 date on your CARISA uh, grant award notifications. In the same token, on your ARP grant award notifications, you'll see that date says, 123024. And then we we as an agency internally but also within DAFs takes the next 30 days to process all of the remaining invoices. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to share a couple key dates. As I mentioned, Carissa ESER 2 and ARP ESER 3 have a date of obligation both September 30th of the applicable year in which the funding was associated. So for CRISA ESER 2, the obligation deadline is September 30th, 2023, which we all are well aware that that was Saturday of last week, being we, you know, there was a number of friendly reminders uh, encouraging SAUs to be sure that their funds were fully obligated by that date to be able to be utilized for programming. We'll speak specifically to Carissa ESER 2 states. So again, based on the information that I just shared, 344 from the Code of Federal Registry, our statutory 120-day liquidation deadline is January 28th of 24. Again, I mentioned the 123023 for Carissa. That is the date in which all SEUs must submit invoices so that the next 28 days can be utilized by ourselves, as well as the Division of Administrative and Financial Services to close out CARISA ESER 2 and draw down funds on your behalf. When it comes to the conversation that we're having today with the late liquidation extension deadline, that is up to an additional 14 months. What we wanna be sure that is clearly understood is this not is not an additional 14 months blanket across the board. It is not additional time to utilize funds. It is purely to be sure that any obligated funds that may need some additional time to be invoiced has the ability to do so. Then we, similar dates you'll see for um, ARP ESER 3. Again, uh, September 30th of 2024 is the obligation deadline. The statutory 120 automatic days is January 28th of 2025 and late liquidation extension deadline, which is fairly new as of September 18th when the US Department of Ed announced that state agencies had the ability to apply for ARP late liquidation extension as well. Being sure that all obligations are timely and properly made before September 30th of 2024. We did provide you a link with the uh, liquidation extension resources that can be found on the U.S. Department of Ed uh, website. So we've talked a lot about obligations and obligations is critical when we talk about any type of liquidation, whether that be the automatic 120 days in statute or the late liquidation application process. So, <clears throat> excuse me, obligation is defined in the Code of Federal Regulations and it is presented in the chart on the right. So a couple of key things is when you are engaging in an obligation that is timely and properly made, that obligation needs to be a written binding agreement, and it has different forms based on either the good or the service that we're engaged in. So for example, if you are looking at an employee of the school department providing additional services to a subset of students, that would fall under B. So B, personal services by an employee of the state, the main department of education, or the subgrantee, the SAU, that work is, and that obligation is only made after their service has been performed. So you will see that 
in the next month or so, if you are submitting invoices for salaries and benefits, we are going to confirm that that employee was only paid through 930 of 2023 for Carissa because the obligation is only when the service is performed. Again, where there's different components of obligation based on what good or service you're providing. So if we skip down to letter F, which is travel, I know that there is a conference or two in October and November that may be of interest to some folks. The conference registration and the travel associated with that conference is obligated when the travel is conducted. So you may have a binding written agreement with an organization for the conference registration, which would fall under, um, under C, but essentially the travel of that conference is not obligated until it's conducted. So if they're taking a bus, a train, an airplane on in November, then that is not a timely and properly obligated component of Carissa ESERT 2 because that obligation only happens in November and all obligations for Carissa ESERT 3 need to take place and transpire before 930 of 23. So now we jump into this concept, which is uh, late liquidation extension. So the US Department of Ed has the authority to approve liquidation extension requests for anything that was properly and timely obligated. And that request has to be in a written form made on behalf of the subgrantee by the grantee. So the SAUs, which are the subgrantees, would submit information, and we'll talk about that application process here in just a moment. And then we, as the main Department of Education, would submit it to the US Department of Ed on your behalf. There are very certain specific factors and circumstances and that based on that obligation and that written request, and all of those are in accordance with Code of Federal Registry, which we've linked here. Some of the key takeaways from that small paragraph at the top is the main Department of Ed must submit a written request on behalf of the SAU. However, the SAU is the one completing the application and providing the information, not the main Department of Education. In the same token, the main Department of Education is not the reviewing or approving agency. That is indeed the US Department of Education. So the US Department of Education is going to review all of the information that the main DOE has submitted on behalf of the SAU, and they will either grant or deny the liquidation extension. What we wanted to highlight here is the US Department of Education's extension request process. So they have released this and that all of this information is available on the website that we provided in the slide earlier. And they released a consolidated application process to be sure that grantees are submitting all of the information that is needed to be reviewed on behalf of the subgrantees. So there's a, a title page, a table of contents with some instructions, the grantee request overview. So we will fill out uh, some information based on each SAU and then provide an overview of what the request is from all of our SAUs that potentially may be engaging in this application process for late liquidation extension. There's a grantee attestation. So indicating that we as an SEA will continue to monitor, review and process all requirements of the funding, even if it was to be extended. Any individual grantee information, and then this next bullet is related to subrecipient information. That is the information that we are obtaining from you folks, SAUs. And then there's an informational page with definitions and additional resources. What the US Department of Ed has suggested is that all of this information be submitted to them prior to December 30th to 
December 31st, my apologies, um, so that there is no lapse in the G5 access. And essentially what the G5 access is, is when an SAU submits a reimbursement request, our team reviews it. We then submit, if approved, we then submit it to the Division of Administrative and Financial Services. Division DAFs reviews it here in-house, and then they go to the G5 system and says, this invoice has been approved. We would like to draw down X number of dollars for District Z, and then we reimburse District Z. So to be sure that we don't um, have any lapse in time, we wanna be sure that we have all of this information to the US Department of Ed as early as possible. And you'll see that we have a, a due date for SAUs of November 28th, 29th, whatever the Wednesday is of the last week of November. So within the EDS late liquidation extension request, the US Department of Ed has stated that grantees, so that being the main Department of Education, must maintain autonomy for the subrecipient sub process documentation and oversight. We, as the main Department of Education, must also confirm that only subrecipients in need of a late liquidation extension should be included in the application process. This bullet in particular speaks to the fact that it is not like a tidings amendment where everybody gets an additional 18 months to utilize their funds. It is very specific in the request with the timely and properly obligated funds. They also have stated that the main department of education should use both the discretion and oversight when including a, a subrecipient within the request. We must collect sufficient documentation to support that the late liquidation is needed, but also that the, the documentation has indicated an obligation that is proper and timely before 9.30. <clears throat> and we must, we may also adjust the subrecipient extension date for administrative purposes at the grant level. What that is alluding to is, again, using the, hundred, the automatic 120 days as an example, that means that the SEA and the SAUs have to close out before January of 2024, for Carissa ESER too, and we indicated on the grant award notifications that all invoices need to be submitted by 1230 because we need those, those 30 days to be able to close out our books. So essentially this last bullet is saying, if the late liquidation extension collectively an additional 14 months is through April 1st of 2025, we can indicate to a, a subgrantee that all items need to be closed out by March 1st of 2025 if there is a need for that grantee to have that extended time. So now we're jumping into the main DOE's late liquidation extension request. So if your SAU would like to submit a liquidation extension request for one or more of its CARISA ESER funded projects, and now we know at the time of the development of these slides, we were not aware that they were going to approve ARP or even review ARP ESER late liquidation extension requests. But we are aware of that now as of the middle of September. So if the SAU would like to submit a late liquidation request for one or more of its CARISA ESER or ARP ESER funded projects, a formal request must be made through the request process by November 20th of 2023 for CARISA ESER and by November 29th, 2024 for ARP ESER. The request form can be found at the link here and we'll be sure to get that in the chat box. Again, highlighting in red at the bottom of this slide that needing more time to expend funds is not an ad adequate justification for a liquidation extension request. Examples may include delays related to supply or labor shortages. So we'll talk a little bit more about the main DOE's extension liquidation request and what is required of an SAU who may 
want to complete this request. A list of each project for which the SAU is requesting the late liquidation extension, a detailed description of each project, and the amount of funds per project for which the SAU is requesting the liquidation extension. My apologies. Another item that is going to be requested from our SAUs in the form that I mentioned in the previous slide. For each project, you will need to have a detailed justifica justification and explanation for funds that may be liquidated by the end of the statutory period, which is 123023 for subgrantees for our SAUs, and 128.24 for the grantee, which is the main department of education. So why a justification about why you cannot liquidate those funds and the automatic statutory requirement that has been provided. And then again, uh, evidence to demonstrate that the funds for which the SAU is requesting liquidation extension have been properly and timely obligated prior to the CRISA obligation deadline of September 30th, 2023, and prior to the ARP ESER obligation deadline of September 30th of 2024. Karen has uh, included the link to the late liquidation extension request form. And what we will do is uh, in the chat box. And what we will do is we will walk through what that form looks like. So you will see it is still entitled Carissa ESER 2 liquidation extension. Um, that is because when all of these materials were developed, we still had not had any indication from the US Department of Ed that this would be applicable for ARP ESER 3. So questions uh, one, two, and three, four are uh, demographic information about the SAU and the individual completing the form, as well as the UEI. Questions five, six, seven, and eight are uh, in, re in reference to the total CRISA allocation. So how much was given to the SAU through the formula model, proportionate of the Title I allocation that was received in 2019. How much of that allocation was obligated as of 9-30-2023? This may not be equivalent to the allocation. It may be that indeed some of the allocation wasn't timely and practically obligated as of 9.30, so we're looking for that information here in question number six. We are also going to look for the amount in which has already been reimbursed to the district as of 9.30, So this amount should align to the federal grant reimbursement system. Again, we're talking about what has been reimbursed to the district. We are well aware that you may have some expenses that have not been reimbursed yet, but what this is indicating is how much have you requested of your allocation from the U.S. Department of Ed through that reimbursement model that we have here in the department. Question number eight is of the amount of CRISA funds, what will be liquidated? by 12-30-2023. So what are those last few items that potentially you may not have had an invoice or a reimbursement request submitted by 9-30, but most definitely will have submitted by 12-30 of 2023? Question number nine is associated with the amount of obligated funds needed for the extension. So this should represent the amount of funds that are included in a binding written commitment for work, services, or products that may not be liquidated before 1230 of 2023. So what I want to highlight here in this question in particular is you can see that the statutory requirements have allowed you some additional time knowing that potentially you need 120 days or 90 days, as I mentioned earlier, to be able to finalize some of the liquidation and submit those last few invoices. 
a late liquidation extension request should not be completed if you know that you're going to uh, be able to draw down those funds and submit them in your reimbursement request before 1230. This late liquidation extension request is only for those uh, circumstances where there may be an obligation that is not fully invoiced before 1230 of 2023. Again, it's not more time to expend the funds, but to be sure that you have uh, an timely and properly obligated amount of money that potentially is supporting services beyond that 120 statutory day requirement under liquidation under the liquidation automatic liquidation period. Question number 10 is going to ask about the use of funds. So what are those projects? and the work that is timely and properly obligated that potentially might fall in the need for the request of late liquidation extension. Question number 11 is going to be a question related to uh, justification for the extension request. As you can see, there is a fair amount of information that an SAU needs to provide to the uh, main Department of Ed to be able to submit on your behalf. Question number 12 is any additional information that you may want to include. Question 13 is related to the attestations. So being aware that the information that has been submitted in this request is accurate, but also understanding that any funds that are being submitted in the late liquidation extension request will need to be continued to be monitored, reported on, uh, accurate documentation will need to be collected and maintained. This, this question number 13 is going to ask for a quote unquote signature. So by entering your name and your title, that is indicating that you've read and understood and are aware of the submission and the request to have the Maine Department of Education submit this information to the U.S. Department of Education for review and approval or um, additional de or, or uh, deny. So a couple things. Now that we've gone over the form that the SAUs need to complete if they're interested in engaging in the late liquidation extension or have a project that might be applicable for the late liquidation extension request. What we are going to do as the Office of Federal Emergency Relief Programs is we will collect all of the submissions and any received prior to nine, uh, November 29th, 2023, we will review with a uh, checklist that will have some information associated with the SAU's risk level and assessment whether or not the SAU has obligated for allowable uses in a timely and proper manner before 930 of 2023, whether or not the SAU has provided an accurate justification for liquidation extension request, whether or not the SAU has provided documentation that successfully demonstrates that the time of the original obligation it was anticipated that the work could be completed within the performance period. And if there is a need for any additional documentation, we have allowed ourselves some time to be able to reach out to the SAU and engage in a conversation about that additional supporting documentation that may be needed. I know that I indicated on the previous slide that the SAU's risk assessment level would be considered and uh, wanted to provide all of us with some additional information about the risk assessment. So a risk assessment is mandatory by the federal government and is completed annually through a tool that was established by the state's office of controller. So the office of the state controller, that is the main office of the state controller and all subrecipients. So all SAUs are assigned a federal fiscal risk assessment based on the following criteria. The size of the award, the accounting system, 
the program complexity, the internal uh, risk, and it also, in the risk assessment, it also includes review of SAU audits and past performance. So we wanted to provide you with all of the questions that we um, have on the Office of State Controllers Risk Assessment. Particularly, you can see that question number five and uh, six A really indicate some areas in which may potentially increase an SAU's risk complexity. And those are the areas in which you find a district might have a higher risk assessment because of a few things that have been listed in 6A, construction, change in leadership, uh, compliance with stakeholder input, meaning that in particular, the ARP plans are out of date or uh, not provided on your website, any additional carryover funds that are exceed 40%, Again, anyone who's familiar with title programs, this risk assessment is also conducted in ESEA and the 6A allows each program to identify some areas that potentially create or could increase a risk of an SAU. So <clears throat> once we have received the extension request form, from an SAU, what our team, as I mentioned, against a checklist, we will determine the following. The SAU's capacity to be able to liquidate within the extension period, and also whether or not the SAU's projects have met the requirements for a liquidation extension request. We will provide a response to the SAU superintendent, ESER applicant coordinator, and business manager, as to whether or not the liquidation extension request meets all the requirements and if it will be included in the state's CARISA ESER late liquidation extension request to the US Department of Education. I also want to highlight the fact that when a district submits a late liquidation extension request, that will also be included in your FY25 ESER risk assessment because essentially it has provided additional time in which uh, funding for ESER needs to be monitored at our SAU level um, for the SEA. Here is uh, the link to the FAQ that the US Department of Ed released. One of the questions that we pulled out was question seven, what are the state's responsibilities if an extension is granted? So once we collect all the information and have determined the information meets the criteria that needs to be submitted to the U.S. Department of Ed, we will submit the information on behalf of the grantees to the U.S. Department of Education. The U.S. Department of Education will also will be the agency who reviews and approves and denies the extension request for the, S, for the individual SEA and the projects within the extension request. What that means is if a SAU is granted the approval from the US Department of Education, as the main Department of Education, we must continue to maintain full responsibility and oversight of the grant through that extension period. So you will see that we will continue to monitor, we will continue to ask for performance reports, we will continue to encourage uh, quarterly uploads for the main financial system. We will also ask for invoices and documentation for that obligation and those invoices that potentially may be uh, requesting payment outside of the, the liquidation period and the performance of, per of period. So I've listed a few key people who might be resources from our team for 